Hey guys, uh, this is a video on perhaps a series that might pop out of this course on common mistakes. Uh, these are things that I've noticed either persisting from unit one or things to avoid on your unit two test or when we get to the next mini AP. So this I think I've addressed in class as well, but students will frequently write when they're, especially when they're uh, showing anything that has to do with continuity, They'll just say the limit from the left and the limit from the right must be the same. And while when you're, you're saying that, it makes sense, it doesn't make any sense to write it. So anytime you have a limit notation being used, you have to follow it up with a function. You, you must do that. So you cannot just have a naked limit floating around. It cannot just be by itself. It has to be followed by a function. The function has to either be defined for you in the problem, or you need to list the function itself. So if the question just says, find the limit of x squared plus 5x, you cannot say f of x here. If the question says, let f of x equal x squared plus 5x, find the limit of that function as x approaches 3, then you can write f of x. So either the question has to tell you the definition of that function, it has to give you a label, Alternatively, you can create a label yourself. So you can start by saying, let f of x or let y equal to x squared plus 5x, and then you can use it. But you cannot just assume that the function you're given with, uh, given or playing with is f of x or g of x. So that's from uh, maybe unit one, but especially when we get the differentiability, uh, you first have to show that the function is continuous, which often requires you to play around with this. So please make sure that anytime you write a limit notation or use limit notation, you must, must, must follow it up with a function here. Similarly, the, the same thing applies for derivatives as well. You cannot just have ddx here. So ddx stands for, and this is exactly the phrase, find the derivative of. This says nothing about what we're finding the derivative of. So if you just have ddx, it's sort of like saying limit as x approaches 6 from the left. Of what? what? What are we finding the limit of? Similarly, ddx means find the derivative of. What are we finding the derivative of? So again, if you're using ddx, you must, must, must follow it up with a function. Now, two ways to avoid that are either you can say dy dx, assuming that y is defined in the problem, or you've done it, or you can write the function itself. So if it's a longer function, it might be better to just define it, uh, especially if it keeps going on and on forever. So let's say we have something obnoxious like this. Now, you don't want to have to write this down over and over and over again in your solution. So you're better off just starting off the problem by saying, especially if the function is not defined, let f of x equals x squared plus sine x, yada, yada, yada. Then you can use df dx, or you can use ddx of f of x. So this indicates find the derivative of a function named f with respect to x. And that sentence shouldn't make too much sense to you right now, but it will once we complete section 3.2 on implicit derivatives. Alternatively, you can say find the derivative of, and then the function comes after. Find the derivative of f of x. But in either case, that function has to either be defined by you or the definition has to be given to us in the problem itself. I believe this is also something that I addressed in class, but uh, if you have to find the derivative of cotangent x, you cannot say, I, I know what you're trying to say here, and you're trying to say that the derivative of cotangent x is the same as the derivative of tangent x. But the way this is written indicates that the derivative of cotangent x is equal to 1 over tangent x, which is not the case. So you would need to include ddx here. And then also on the right-hand side, bottom times the derivative of the top minus top times the derivative of the bottom, all over bottom squared. The lack of parentheses here makes this a mistake. So this is currently saying find 
x squared and then take the tangent of it. So this is tangent of x squared. What we want to say instead is tangent of x, the quantity squared. So either you want to write this. The safer choice is actually to do this, is to write tangent squared of x. Uh, this is my preferred way of writing tangent squared or, you know, trig functions raised to a power. It, it sort of removes all doubt about what is being squared, the argument x or the function tangent of x. Uh, two things that, or one thing that popped up on the last mini AP while I was grading it, quite a few people did this, uh, especially with a problem that had, I think, something with two trig functions. But uh, to find the derivative of x squared plus 4 times x cubed minus 5, notice that I said the word times when I was reading this problem. So from here on out, I would recommend that whenever you're asked to find the derivative of a function, read it out in your head. The moment you hear yourself the, the, say the word times, immediately, at least when I'm doing it, I take a minute, derivative of the first times the second, plus the derivative of the second times the first. I write that little accounting thing, and then that way that reminds me, oh, I have to use the product rule here. So the mistake hopefully is obvious. What students did was they found the derivative of just the first function, derivative of x squared is 2x, derivative of 4 is 0, so that's gone. They just found the derivative of the first function and the derivative of the second function and multiplied those two together. That is not a thing. That, that is not the product rule. You have to use the product rule when you have a product of two functions. What we cannot do is simply find the derivative of the first function, find the derivative of the second function, and multiply them together. That works with sums and differences. It does not work with products or quotients. Which leads us into a next example. Uh, let's say we're asked to find the derivative of cotangent x. Cotangent x is the same as cosine x over sine x. Notice that here I've used the derivative notation correctly. What I'm saying is the derivative of cotangent x is equal to the derivative of cosine x over sine x, which is a true statement. Contrast that with the derivative of cotangent x is 1 over tangent x, which is incorrect. It's not. So coming back here, a uh, common mistake again is finding the derivative of just the top and finding the derivative of just the bottom. We cannot do that. If you have a quotient of two functions, you must use the quotient rule. Uh, a note at this stage, uh, I've seen a couple of people do this, so this is more of a side note. If your function looks like this, could you use the quotient rule on it? Absolutely. There's nothing preventing you from using the quotient rule. x squared is a function. 12 is a constant function. So sure, it's a ratio of functions. You can use the quotient rule. However, it's infinitely simpler to rewrite the problem as 1 over 12 times x squared and then just use the power rule. Keep the 1 12th around. Find the derivative of x squared, get 2x, multiply that by 1 12th, and you get your answer. So as uh, I don't know how many people have watched the videos for, actually, no, we, we finished those sections. So hopefully everyone has watched the videos on AP Classroom. Uh, there were quite a few questions that Jerome did where he went into, would you use the quotient rule on this problem, or would you just algebraically simplify first? and then find the derivative using an easier rule. From here on out, whenever you're asked to find the derivative, pause. Don't say, oh, it's a product, so I should use the product rule. There might be uh, maybe a 30-second algebraic manipulation that results in using a much easier rule or a much simpler rule. So go with what makes life the easiest for you. Don't go after the lowest hanging fruit and say, oh, I have you know, a quotient, so I'm going to start using the quotient rule for x squared over 12. It will work, but you'd be wasting a huge, a massive amount of time. Uh, notation for differentiation or for finding derivatives. There's three primary ones or popular ones. One is the prime notation. So prime is sort of this apostrophe or this uh, forward-leaning dash that you put in the superscript of a function. The way you read it is f prime or y prime if there's y and then a prime above it. And then if you have f prime of x, 
that's how you would read that. Now, what you can also do is, it's difficult to read this, but if you had a function inside parentheses with a prime on the outside, that basically means find the derivative of this function. So, oops. What I, what we could also write this as is say 2x plus 3 prime. So that means find the derivative of 2x plus 3, and the answer would be 2. So that's another use of prime notation. Operator notation, this is less commonly used uh, in differential equations, it's used a lot more, but you can use the derivative operator, so capital D. And then the way you would read this is d sub x of y. You can also replace y with f of x. And the way you would read this is d sub x of f of x. This means find the derivative of f of x with respect to x. Find the derivative of y with respect to x. Now again, this with respect to business will make more sense once we've done implicit derivatives. But for now, just know that that's what it means or stands for. Uh, Leibniz notation is more frequently used. So Leibniz and prime notation are used most frequently, uh, at least for our purposes. The way you would read this is dy dx. And it means find the derivative of a function named y. The function name is always on top. The variable with respect to which you're differentiating goes on the bottom. So you read this as dy dx. You can also write it as df dx. So this assumes that the name of the function is f, and you're differentiating with respect to x. Alternate notations are, as I said earlier, if you have dy, oh, sorry, if you have ddx, like we said right here, if you have ddx, you must follow it up with a function here. So coming down, you can say ddx of some function in parentheses, and that's okay. And the way you would read that is d dx of, say, x squared plus 5, or whatever the function happens to be. Now, here's an example of uh, a very common question that you're going to get throughout the course. Find the equation of a tangent line to the graph of some function at a given point. So here, the function is very simple, y equals x cubed minus 5. And we're finding the equation of the tangent line at x equals 2. So first, I'll show you the, the correct solution, and then perhaps show you some common mistakes that people make. So this is the bare minimum that you would need to write in order to get full credit. So here I've written y equals x cubed minus 5. This is my function. Then I'm going to use Leibniz notation to indicate the derivative, dy dx equals derivative of this using power rule would be 3x squared. Now notice that I have to evaluate this derivative at some x value. If I do that, or if I, when I want to do that, I have to make this evaluation bar, which is this vertical line, and then write x equals whatever the number I'm evaluating it at down below. So this would be read as dy dx at x equals 2. So that means take your dy dx function and plug in 2 for x. So if we do that, we get 3 times 2 squared, which is 3 times 4, which is 12. So this gives us the slope of the curve or the slope of the tangent line at x equals 2. Now, in order to write the equation, we need an x value, we need a, a slope, and we also need a y value. So here, notice that I'm not writing dy dx evaluated at x equals 2. I'm writing y at x equals 2. So this is going to find the y value when x is equal to 2. So here we plug in 2 into the original function, x cubed minus 5. So we get 2 cubed minus 5. 2 cubed is 8. 8 minus 5 yields 3. Now here I wrote down the point-slope form of the equation of a straight line and then plugged in the numbers where they belong. So this would be the equation of the tangent line to the graph of y equals x cubed minus 5 at x equals 2. Now, these two are incorrect uh, solutions, even parts that are incorrect. So here, the individual writes y equals x cubed minus 5, which equals 3x squared, which equals 3 times 2 squared, which equals 12. 
Now you can cry until the cows come home or you're blue in the face and say, I got the right slope. This would be graded as a zero on the AP exam. You're stating that y is equal to x cubed minus five, and somehow miraculously that is also equal to three x squared, and somehow miraculously, even more miraculously, that turns into three times four, which is 12. So these two statements make sense, but the first three do not. Why is it that, or how is it that this function is equal to this? So hopefully you recognize the need for identifying what your original function is, what your derivative function is, and when you're evaluating your derivative at a particular point versus when you're evaluating your function at a particular point. Now this individual, you know, used the derivative notation correctly. So they said y is equal to x cubed minus five. Then they wrote y prime using prime notation, y prime equals 3x squared. Both of these steps are correct. Now the mistake happens here where the student or the individual wrote 3x squared equals 3 times 2 squared. That's not true. 3x squared is not equal to 12. The function 3x squared evaluated at x equals 2 equals 12. So that's what's missing here. This would get the point or earn the point for finding the correct derivative but would lose the point for finding the slope. Even though the slope is numerically correct, this would not get any points. Uh, this is commonly on the AP exam called a linkage error. Linkage error means you're linking two things that should not be linked. So we're saying that this three times two squared is the same as three X squared when it really isn't. Uh, three times two squared is not equal to dy dx, it's equal to dy dx evaluated at X equals two. Now, how do you avoid these mistakes, uh, especially when you're writing these problems for homework or when you're doing these things in class? The more careful you are with your notation, especially when you're not being graded, when you're, when you're learning this material, it, it sounds like a lot of work, but the more careful you are writing your solutions out from the very first time you have to, the better you'll have a time or the easier time you'll have when you're taking a test. Number two, read out what you've written as a sentence. So I'll stop there or pause there for a second and, and read the following. Uh, actually, let's read the correct solution. The function y is equal to x cubed minus five. The derivative of y with respect to x is three x squared. The derivative of a function named y with respect to x at x equals two is three times two squared, which is also equal to three times four, which is also equal to 12. The function value at x equals two is two cubed minus five, which is eight minus five, which is three. Point slope form of the equation of a straight line is y minus y one equals m times the quantity x minus x one. The equation of the line is y minus three equals 12 times the quantity x minus two. So hopefully that makes sense. And if I were you know, lecturing to you in class, those are all the words I would say as I was explaining this. Now let's try the same exercise with these two things on the right-hand side. The function y is equal to x cubed minus five, which is the same as three x squared, which is the same as three times two squared, which is the same as 12. Hopefully, as you heard me say that, that just sounds nonsensical. These three things or four things are not the same. Here, we have a different error. Uh, well, similar class because it's a linkage error, but an error nonetheless. The function y is equal to x cubed minus five. The derivative of y is equal to three x squared, which is three times two squared, which is 12. Three x squared is not the same as 12. So when you read out what you've written, Chances are you catch a mistake. Chances, chances are that you catch a linkage error if you read this out. And the third and probably the best piece of advice I can give you that renders the first two useless is if you write your solutions in complete sentences to begin with. So here's the same exact solution as the left-hand side here, but written out the way I personally would write this in my notebook when I was doing, when I, if I were doing homework for the first time. The function y is equal to x cubed minus five. 
Then the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to 3x squared. The derivative at x equals 2 is dy dx at x equals 2 equals 3 times 2 squared equals 12. This is also the slope of the tangent line at x equals 2. So here I'm telling the author, or the reader rather, that, hey, I understand how to find the derivative, and I also know that this number that I have found is the slope of the tangent line. So if you have correct interpretations of what you're finding as you go along, if you have a brain fart and you make a silly mistake here, you know, 3 times 4 is, I don't know, 15, let's say, you would still potentially, I can't guarantee it, it depends on the table readers, but you can still get some credit for saying, I have the right idea. I know what I'm looking for. I know that the derivative is going to give me the slope of the tangent line. I just found the wrong number. Here, you're not giving the reader anything to hold on to. You're just finding that the derivative is 3x squared. And let's say that this turned out to be 15. You're not saying that, oh, this number that I was looking for, I was going to use as the slope of the tangent line. You do it here, it's implied, but if you make a mistake here, there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing that the AP reader can give you partial credit for. Versus here, you can say, or you know, a generous AP reader would say, well, this person knew that's what they were finding. They were finding the slope of the tangent line when they find the derivative at x equals 2 there's a greater likelihood of getting partial credit here versus the above solution. Then at x equals 2, y will be equal to 2 plugged into the original function, 2 cubed minus 5, which ends up being 3. And then finally, the equation of the tangent line to the function at 2 comma 3, that's my point, is, and here's where I write the equation. So we have the same exact answer as we did previously. We have the same exact answer as this. However, here, this is a lot easier to review from when you're reviewing for a test. You're not just looking at a sequence of steps and trying to figure out, well, why did I do that? Why is it that I found the derivative at x equals 2? What did I do with this number 12? Now, again, right now it sounds like a silly exercise because you're, you're, you're looking at the solution. but what happens two weeks from now? If you're looking at this, maybe you figure it out, maybe you don't. But again, you're, you're causing yourself more work and more harm, especially when nerves are high and anxiety levels are high. The cleaner you write your solutions to begin with, the better you will be at articulating your thoughts and then increasing or maximizing your opportunity for getting partial credit. So hopefully that helps. That's all I have for now. And as we get into unit three, I'll try to identify any other places that you want to be careful at. So hopefully that helps. Enjoy the rest of your day.